please rise for confession. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? O Lord, with you there is forgiveness, therefore we are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed and cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as His people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace, for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, chapter 5. St. Paul writes, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, Sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit 
the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the gospel. Because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And together we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. And I should give you apologies for two weeks ago when I was here last, and I neglected to have us say the, the Athanasian Creed. I remember two weeks earlier to give Berta all the things from the bulletin, didn't write myself a note, so next year we'll do it twice. <laughs> Son, who with the Father and the Son, 
together is worship and glorify. Who swore by the prophets? And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
They have no sin. They, she knows that because we've talked about this. I have a little beagle dog that drives my wife crazy. And I remind her that he's the only one in the house who's not a sinner. Because he's not. He has no sin. Animals are not under the curse of Adam and Eve. They are not born sinners. And so they don't sin. We are. There's another important difference. And that is, we are created in the image and likeness of God. We learn that in Genesis chapter 1. They are not. They, of course, are God's creation. But we are created like God. Not the same as God. Never even remotely close to equal to God. But we bear His likeness. There is his being and doing in ways that are a part of us. But, as you say, because of sin we are corrupted. And we do not always bear forth that image and likeness. But here's the important part of this. Because you are created in the image of God, you are valuable. You are important. Because of that alone, it's not because you accomplished a lot of cool stuff. It's not because you always listen to your parents and authority figures and do what you're supposed to do. It's because you are created in God's image. You bear His likeness. So you have value. Never let anyone tell you that you are not important, that you do not have value. Because you are created in God's image, you are valuable. In your baptism into Christ, you were also adopted as the Heavenly Father's sons and daughter. You're an adopted child of God. You are brothers and sister of Jesus. And so all of the things that belong to Jesus belong to you. The kingdom of God is yours, and you shall live in it in eternity. For the Father who has made you, through His Son's death upon the cross, has paid for your sins. That the Holy Spirit has put faith in your heart. That you believe this. That Jesus died in your sins, or died in your place, answered for your sins. So that you shall live in heaven with Him forever. But because God, through Christ, is redeeming the whole world and all creation, the animals, will be there as well. Let us pray. Kind Father, we live in a day and age in which there is much anger and fighting between people, particularly in our own society. We live in a world in which many try to tear others down, tell them that they are of no worth and value. Father, remind us always that everyone created in your image, and bearing your likeness, is of incredible worth because they are created in your image and likeness. But even more so still, because they were worthy to have Jesus die in their place and answer for their sins. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a great week. In the name of Jesus, amen. This morning's gospel lesson from Luke chapter 9 is one of the more complicated lessons in the whole gospel of Luke. As we read it, it is not uncommon to find ourselves having more questions than answers. There are a lot of things that happen in this very short passage that leave us scratching our heads and wondering. There are three points, three takeaways that we receive in this passage that I want to highlight this morning. The first is that because God 
never gives up on people. We should never give up on people. Secondly, even when we feel that we have crossed the line and have cut ourselves off from God, there is no place that we can go to be outside of the reach of the forgiveness won through Christ's shed blood on the cross. And in the third place, following Jesus means that He, not us, sets the agenda. We do not get to determine what our discipleship will look like. We simply follow as He leads. And so the passage begins with what is the turning point verse of this gospel. What we will see is from here on out, everything is directed towards Jerusalem. So verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, and here we have a reference not unlike John will use in chapter 3 of the crucifixion. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Numbers chapter 22, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So when the time comes for Him to be taken up, He set His face to go to Jerusalem. Sort of an odd phrasing. But the emphasis here is not simply that He planned to go, but that He was resolute in his plans to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to Jerusalem and there's not a thing that can sidetrack or divert him from going to Jerusalem. This is the Father's will for him. This is the will from the very beginning before the foundations of the world that Christ Jesus being born one of us would die in our place and answer for our sins. And so nothing will sidetrack and divert him from going to Jerusalem. And so from here through chapter 18, they're on the way. We call it the travel narrative. And this is where we get some of the most familiar passages of Luke's gospel. We have at 19, which is one chapter ahead of 18, so you can include 19 in the travel narrative. All right, the truth is, it is chapter 19, but I got confused. <laughs> 9 through 19 is the travel narrative. As soon as I said Zacchaeus, I knew I was in trouble. But we have Zacchaeus at the end. But before we get to Zacchaeus, we have the parable of the Good Samaritan. We have Mary and Martha. Both of those are in chapter 10. In chapter 15, we have the parable of the lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons, also called the prodigals. And so Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. They're traveling. He is teaching. And the first stop on the way is Samaria. Because they are in Galilee. And they're headed towards Jerusalem. Now you always go up to Jerusalem. It doesn't matter if you start out on Mount Everest or Mount Kilimanjaro. You go up to Jerusalem. It's symbolic. And so if you're reading in the psalm, sometimes you'll see a psalm of ascent. For example, Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my hope come from? And you say, what is a song of ascent? It's simply one of the psalms that they would sing when they would make the yearly pilgrimages thrice a year to Jerusalem. You go up, ascending, even if you're coming from Galilee, which topography will tell you is going down. But there's more to this heading to Jerusalem business. You need to pass through Samaria, which is not Israel. They are the cousins of Israel, and they are, at this point in history, basically the avowed enemies of Israel. So typically, if you would travel from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. You would go down a little bit southward, cross the Jordan, scoot the rest of the way south on the other side of the Jordan River, 
and then cross back over to Jerusalem, just avoiding the Samaritans completely. They were cousins. These were the ten tribes of the north with their capital at Samaria. But they changed, twisted the religion of the Jews. They said, first and foremost, there's one Bible. It's the first five books that's in. And then they went in there and they changed some things in there. For example, it, we read in a few places that the worship of God is to occur in Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem isn't a part of their country. So they just broke out the, the eraser. And they wrote in Mount Gerizim, which was in Samaria. And they said, see this? We are worshiping God as we're supposed to. Not like those people in the south. That's what's going on when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, the well. And she says, well, we worship on the mountain, but you say that we must worship in Jerusalem. She is alluding to this big difference in how they believe. And what's more, when they were in exile, the northern kingdom was exiled about a hundred and some years earlier by Assyria. And they intermarried. The southern kingdom was exiled by the Babylonians and did not intermarry. So when they all returned to the land, later on, 70 years later, the people in the southern kingdom, they say, we don't know who those people are. We have no idea who they are. Hence, you hear about the lost tribes of Israel. The lost ten tribes. And sometimes you'll see it come up on a documentary. You know, just makes you want to face plant. They were never lost. It's just that their cousins refused to identify them as who they were. That's all. And so you have this animosity for years. Jesus decides he's going to go through Samaria. He's done it before. So I met the woman at the well. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. The bottom line is they don't like people going to Jerusalem. And they don't like Jews. And so they're not interested in showing hospitality to a guy and his disciples who are going to Jerusalem. It's sort of like if you pull in a Target, go into the service desk and say, excuse me, I'm going to be doing some shopping over at Walmart. Is it okay if I leave my car in your parking lot? They don't want that. That's the rival. Same thing. And so this is when it gets good. And when Jesus' disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? It's just laughable. It's laughable. As you read the gospel lessons and you see how on one occasion they are unable to cast out a demon from a young boy. And when Jesus <coughs> casts it out, they say to him, why were we unable to cast it out? As if they're these great spiritual people. And Jesus says, well, you know, this kind of demon can only be cast out by prayer. Meaning, you're supposed to look to the Father for things. You're not a magician. You're not some kind of spiritual giant. So given their track record in many other places, the reader must conclude they don't have the capacity to call down enough hellfire to touch off a July 4th spark. Not at all. It's laughable. But the intent is scary. The intent is scary. They couldn't be any farther from Jesus' agenda. He comes to seek the lost, to forgive sinners, to make a way for restoration of the relationship with the Father. And these guys, they won't see them all killed. Okay, they won't welcome you. Let's destroy them. Let's annihilate them. Let me get a flamethrower from heaven and wipe them out. Now before we look at Jesus' response, I just want to point out to you that Jesus is operating in a world before headache medicine. There is no eccentric, no Advil, no Aleve, no Anacin, not even aspirin. He 
he's got to deal with these guys without any kind of headache mess. But he turned and he rebuked them. It doesn't say what he said. Something perhaps along the line, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? They won't welcome us, so you want to kill them? What we discover later in Luke's second book, the Acts of the Apostles, look at chapter 8. What you see is Philip, one of Jesus' disciples. Philip makes his way down to Samaria. This is after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And he sends them out by the power of the Spirit. And he preaches the good news that Jesus the Christ has died in their place, answered for their sins, and they believe it. They believe it. And they trust in Jesus. Their souls have been redeemed for eternity. But it would never happen if these blockheads had had their way. They would have been sent to their death before receiving. God does not give up on people. And neither should we. You know people in your life who do not trust and believe in Jesus. If you do not, you really need to get out and meet some people. There's a lot of them. And I hope that you're praying for them. Your role is not to cram Jesus down their throat. That doesn't work. Otherwise, everyone who has ever watched religious programming would have come to believe and sent all their money to these guys. It doesn't work. Your role is to share with them the importance that your faith in Christ makes in your life. And the fact that Jesus has died in their place also. Beyond that, beyond being a good friend, modeling what it is to follow this Jesus, you are to be praying for them. Praying for their conversion. <coughs> and if you are praying, don't give up so easily. Don't say, well, you know, I prayed for two months and they're not come to the faith. I guess it's not going to work for them. It's just not for them. Persistence in prayer. Not giving up on them. And not becoming angry with them. And saying, well, you know what? If you're not going to accept my efforts on your behalf, forget you. God doesn't forget people. God doesn't give up on people. You shouldn't either. And the second point here, a lesson about you and me and all people from the Samaritans that Jesus does not crush because they were unwelcoming is that there is really no place that we can go that puts us out of the reach of the grace of God. I mean, these folks, they were pretty far off. They cut off most of the Old Testament said, we'll keep five books and we're going to change some stuff in here that we don't like. And then, they decide they're going to hate on the rest of God's people. And Jesus spares them. That the Holy Spirit working through Philip and others might work faith in their hearts and they too will be saved. What a surprise. When those who came to believe in Jesus from the southern kingdom among the Jews go to heaven and see there the Samaritans who also came to faith in Jesus by the power of the Spirit. That's how the kingdom of God works. That's what the reign of God looks like. Don't give up on people because God doesn't. And don't give up on yourself. Don't believe you have crossed some line that cannot be uncrossed because the power of the reach of the cross is such that it goes to any length to bring you back. We have three more episodes that we'll go over kind of quickly because I really can't explain them to you. So as they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Kind of nice. 
He's not very popular. So they wouldn't even receive him. The Pharisees are trying to figure out how to kill him. And so this guy says, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus' response is a little bit mysterious. He said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And you say, what? Um, what? He says, I'll follow you wherever you go, and you say this? Yes. Remember, his face is set towards Jerusalem. He's going to the cross. And he wants everyone who will come to him to understand that following him means sacrifice. Following him means giving up many of the luxuries and pleasures of this life. Following him is filled with uncertainty. If you're going to follow me, be prepared for this. Just as he says elsewhere. Anyone who will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. The next situation. He says to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus responds, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Sounds a bit harsh, huh? As I said earlier, I can't explain these. I can give you some suggestions for thinking about them, that's it. Suggestion one. In many burials in the Near East and among the Jews, there were two stages of entombment. The first is you lay the body in the tomb. After nature has run its course, you go back a year or so later, and you pack up all the bones in what I call a bone box. It has an actual name, and I can never remember it. And they found the bone box of James, uh, the Lord's brother, about 10, 12 years ago. And it, yeah, it has a special name. You can Google it. Perhaps I should Google it. But in order to make more space in tombs, you collect the bones, you put them in this box, and they take up a lot more, a lot less space. So maybe the father has already died and is in the tomb. And he's talking about the secondary burial. Somebody else can take care of that. Secondly, at the end of the day, what can he do for his father, really? His father's dead. There's not another thing he can do for his father. But to speak to others about the coming reign of God in Christ can save people's eternity. Compare them. This is another lesson. When you're strapped with crazy wishes from people who have died. You know, people say, no, when I die, I want you to do thus and so. Sometimes people don't want to do those things, but are deeply troubled about those things. It's my job to give them permission to ignore the last wishes. It's my job sometimes to do it for them. For example, many times I've had families come in, mom or dad or Uncle Fred, didn't want any kind of a funeral, but we feel kind of badly not having a funeral. We feel like, you know, we need that closure. So. And I said, no problem. Let's have the funeral. And we'll say it's my decision. And they can come back on me if it's a problem. Third suggestion as we look at this instance. Third suggestion. Most important. This is based in fact, not my guessing. What does he say to Jesus? First, let me go and bury my father. That's the problem. That's the real problem here. He's setting conditions on how he will follow. That's not following. That's leading. We don't get to dictate the terms to Jesus on what our discipleship will look like. Ours is to follow. And the way that we follow is by spending a lot of time in prayer and in reading the scriptures. 
This is how God speaks to us. This is how God reveals His will to us. Let's face it. If we're not spending a lot of time in prayer and in the scriptures, we will have no idea, not a clue, of what God's will is for our life. But as we're in prayer, as we're reading the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is speaking and leading and directing. But we don't get to dictate the terms. So the response sounds harsh. But it needs to be harsh. It needs to rattle the cages. Because the follow is to follow. That's not to set the terms. The last instance in this passage. Yet another said, I will follow you. Sounds familiar. Just like the first guy. I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my house. Okay, first glance sounds like a pretty simple request. Let me just go back to the house and say farewell. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And you say, Wow, that's really harsh. He just wants to check back in, poke his head in. And Jesus says, If you're looking back at the former things, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. I don't know what is really going on here. My suspicion is it's more than just goodbye, but it's about settling affairs, gaining the approval of the people in the house, a whole bunch of stuff. Jesus is set towards Jerusalem. You're either coming or you're not. You decide now. But know this, know this, anyone, who puts his hand to the plow and turns around to the former things is not ready for the kingdom of God. It's not fit for the kingdom of God. This is a message of grace. It sounds harsh, but a message of grace. Because we're being called to follow the Jesus set his face to Jerusalem who dies in your place answers for your sins. And he calls you to go forward with Him. What a gift to take all the burdens of the former times, all the things you keep going back to, dwelling on, ruminating on, and saying, I must look forward. These things have to go. He's saying to let go of the baggage, let go of everything that holds you in the past, and live into the future. Most of us carry a lot of burdens that we need to hear this command of Jesus. Let it go. Drop it. Stop looking back and look to me. He is the one who has secured your future, the future in heaven. And He is the one who secures your safety, your life, and everything good in the here and now. Jesus says to you, you who are burdened with many things, you who are tempted to set the condition of your discipleship, Lord, after this, I will follow you, or I will give myself to you. Lord, when I have more time, Lord, when I have more money, Jesus says, follow me. Gives you permission to let go and follow Him where He leads. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Please rise for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and eternal God, keep us in repentance and faith that we may not depart from Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Bring to repentance all enemies of your church and those who do not yet know you, that by faith, 
They may confess Jesus Christ as Lord with us and amend their lives by the power of your gracious spirit. Give us courage for the path set before us that we may not faint or grow weary, but endure to the day of Christ's coming and receive the blessed well done of your favor when we enter through Christ to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, lend your grace and spirit to the nations and those who lead them, but especially to our President, the Congress of these United States, the Governor, the Legislature, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Teach us to contend for the faith within the public square, so that your voice may be heard by all people. Inspire and equip us by your Spirit, that we may be led to every virtue and character and holiness of life. Father, as our nation this week remembers our struggle for independence from Great Britain, Father, we pray that you would indeed inspire in us a greater appreciation for the sacrifices that others have made for the sake of our freedom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, defend us from all disaster, both natural and man-made, from scarcity and famine, from war and violence, and from every danger. Give to the land fruitfulness and prosper all lawful labor, that the hungry may be fed, the homeless given shelter, the abused safety, and the poor relief. Bless those whom we have named on our prayer list, and those we now name in the thoughts of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. 